Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the COP25 or the environmental discussions on the climate change that has started today in Spain. This is the COP25, the annual group meet, annual meeting of the countries regarding the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Now we know that the US is walking out of the Paris Agreement, yes. but the focus seems to be if we take the UN Secretary General statement regarding the COP25 on big emitters. And uh, here it doesn't take into account the fact that big emitters are also, some of them are big populations. And this seems to be forgetting all about historical emissions or the per capita emissions, because ultimately it's people who emit carbon dioxide through their consumptions of different kinds. Sure. So this is a huge gap in the current COP25 or the current climate change discussions. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Uh, however, this has been the, uh, or has become the dominant narrative since the Paris Agreement. Because as we have discussed before, the Paris Agreement uh, completely ignores historical emission, uh, has uh, deliberately taken on what the Americans and the Paris Agreement call a forward-looking perspective. That is, you forget what's happened before, let's just look at what's ahead. In that scenario then, you don't look at historical emissions and even looking forward, you're looking only at total national numbers. Per capita comes in if you are emphasizing equity. Since there is no emphasis on equity in the Paris Agreement, either historically or on per capita terms, both these are missed out. So the big names that come up are the US, the EU as a bloc, China and India. <laughs> Irrespective of the fact Irrespective that, of the fact that you, you, if you take, for instance, individual countries, like right. France or England, that's right. have small populations compared to India and China. Absolutely. But their per capita emissions are something like six times, that's eight right. times higher. That's right. And in the US, for example, uh, it's about 14 times the per capita consumption of India, uh, of India and the emissions uh, of India. Uh, uh, this is a has been a problem and in fact this has been the aim of the US in steering the uh, climate uh, talks from uh, very early on and leading up to Copenhagen. This is a self-declared objective and in fact Hillary Clinton has even written an op-ed piece at the time of Copenhagen summit saying this was what we had set out to achieve this forward-looking perspective and not addressing uh, equity and per capita, and we have achieved this. And Trump has said that he's walking out the Paris Agreement because That's India right. and China are quote unquote in disturbed cheating. That's that right. arguing that the US should also be considered a big emitter, which it yeah. is. But per capita terms, it's uh, as you said, 14 times for instance right. per capita Indian emission. That's right. Coming back to the issue of the global uh, climate change itself, uh, if we look at the what would be called the current best case scenario for science, which yeah. is looking at carbon budgets, yes. not looking at CO2 numbers, but looking at the carbon budget and arguing that the carbon budget that is existing is roughly X number of gigatons. And in that, I think the figure changes, of course, whether it is 1.5 degree centigrade That's is right. your target or 2 degree a centigrade lot. is your target. And of course, there's a huge difference. Huge difference. But if we look at what is left of the carbon budget uh, today, it seems that we are eating up this budget much faster than what the commitments were and what the scenario for limiting up to 1.5 degree demands. And even if we look at two degree scenario, we seem to be slipping badly. Yes. And at this rate, if we look at what was desired of the uh, climate change negotiations, what was the best case scenario for two degrees centigrade, we are really slipping it to the extent that it seems that we are looking at a three degree centigrade by 2100. Absolutely. And this is the one place where what Secretary General uh, Gutierrez has said, and what the emissions gap report has said uh, has to be taken uh, at its uh, face uh, value that this is the reality on a global scale. 
the issues we were talking about is therefore then how do we tackle this and what does each nation do but if you look at the global picture it's very clear that uh, the prospect of irreversible climate change is now visible uh, it's gone beyond the stage where you could say it's further down the line. Uh, it may come. Now it is very clear that we are staring at it. And in fact, we are hurtling towards uh, that phase. And like you said, even if you take all the uh, voluntary pledges made at Paris, the sum of the NDCs leads you to about 3.2 to 3.5. Uh, degree Celsius temperature rise by the end of the century. And the other targets in Paris at the global level were to reach carbon neutrality, that is net zero emissions by 2050, which meant that maximum you would have to freeze global emissions right about now for 2 degrees and in another 10 years for 1.5. We don't seem to be getting there either. I didn't get it. Uh, if you say 1.5, we have to freeze emissions later. No, now. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. So 1.5 it again. is now. And, yeah. If we have to limit our emissions for 1.5, when should we stop emitting or reach zero uh, yeah. increase? If we are talking about 1.5, we really should have been at a global level uh, at peak emissions roughly about now. And after that, cut down and, after and quite that, steeply. That's right. And if you're talking about 1.5, 2, uh, uh, 2 degrees, you have a 10 year or so. Uh, Before yeah. you start cutting down that's right. again. That's right. So the more you miss these targets, what it means is you have to start cutting even, even more, more steeply, steeply later. later. And after 2050, start doing what is called negative emissions, That's right. which means you have to suck carbon out of the That's atmosphere, right. for which, which no known technologies absolute. exist as of now. Absolutely. Now, coming back to the yeah. issue that you said about the pledges, these yeah. are voluntary pledges. Yes. But if you look at the figures that UNEP report has presented yeah. for the COP25, yeah. that shows that even those pledges are not being ordered. In fact, the rise of carbon emissions goes beyond forget the pl pledges, yeah. but even beyond the pledges to the extent that these are, we are tending to see a faster rise of carbon emissions right now. Yes. Uh, and there, unfortunately, uh, is where again national uh, performance figures uh, come into play. Notably China, uh, which uh, whose emissions are rising very fast, uh, even today. And even on per capita terms, Chinese emissions today on per capita terms are getting pretty close to the European Union's uh, emissions per capita. Uh, that is high. And the Chinese at uh, Paris have pledged peaking year for China at 2035, which means you can expect China to continue to grow for at least the next 10 years. Uh, if that happens on an absolute uh, basis, uh, you are not going to be able to meet these global targets very uh, Yeah, but the interesting part is that, for instance, now, Japan is exceeding whatever it had committed. Yes. Small country compared yes. to China, but still there. Yes. You have European Union, which seems to be half of them seem to be backing off from their promises, except countries like Germany, which are yeah. still sticking to basically their targets. And the United States, which is abandoning it anyway, yeah. and has said it is going to go over to a carbon, uh, carbon rich future yes. because it doesn't believe in global warming. Yeah. And you have a White House which yes. says essentially Absolutely. that global warming is a myth. Yeah. Yeah. But what you're saying is these are already visible. Yeah. But you know that when you talk of these being visible, you mean already the patterns predicted That's right. that you will start seeing a change in rainfall patterns. That's All right. of this is already it's starting already to started. happen. And you're getting extreme weather events, That's which right. are not directly correlated with. But you can see the rise of such events. Sure. And you see also summer temperatures we are getting hottest summer temperatures right. ever consistently That's right. over the last 10-15 right. years. years. And yeah. this has been every year we seem to be breaking the record. Yes. Now, you know, the question about when people talk about two to three degrees 
uh, average rise. Uh, people tend to think that, you know, okay, from 32 average, it will go to 34. That's not such a big deal. But they don't realize the summer peak could go from, say, 45 in Delhi to 50 degrees. That's right. So, we are really talking of extremes of temperature. That's right. Which would rise by as much as 5 degrees to 6 degrees. That's right. But it's not just the temperature rise which is going to affect even human beings. Uh, if you say our summers are going to get uncomfortably hot, uh, yes, they are, uh, but you're also going to see more numbers of and prolonged heat waves, which means persistent temperatures of 49 or thereabouts for a period of two weeks, three weeks. Uh, that's when you will start seeing, as has already started happening in Europe, deaths due to heat, uh, heat stroke uh, running into the thousands which Europe has not experienced, is not ready for, uh, affects the elderly and the already infirm, infants uh, and so on. But this is directly as it affects humans uh, biologically. But the effects in terms of extreme weather events, uh, sea level rise which is going to inundate uh, I'm going to stop you one minute yeah. on this. When you talk about the weather, such events, high temperatures, two to three weeks in Europe, well, heat waves would also have huge effects on Absolutely. Asia and Africa. Absolutely. Because already we have hundreds of people who die in heat waves Absolutely. every year. So these numbers are really going to rise dramatically. Absolutely. And second part of it that's going to happen, also drought drinking water. That's right. And then, of course, the change in seasons that we are seeing exactly. monsoons come much later every year. Exactly. This whole rainfall pattern changing That's and lastly right. agriculture. Precisely. Because all these are going to impact on agriculture and crops. Uh, even in simple biological terms, more drastically perhaps than they are going to affect uh, Human beings. you and me. Uh, in the sense your wheat crop, for example, is going to start uh, behaving erratically even with uh, two degrees uh, Celsius rise in temperature and it is predicted that India, for example, will have something like a 20% net drop of uh, yields in wheat. Now, let's also look at the weather when you say the weather patterns changing. It also, the argument is you could also not only will have rise of sea levels, but also complete change of the rainfall patterns. Absolutely. And the argument here is the temperate lands will see wetter uh, climate it will see higher temperature, which might be good for the temperate uh, people, people living in temperate climate, but it will adverse affect what today really are the poorer sections That's right. living between the tropics. Exactly. Exactly. So even the climate change, and this could explain why the wealthy nations, which effectively are the ones in the uh, temperate climates, Europe, United States, etc., they are far less concerned about global warming unless there are countries like Germany, which have sure. taken this very seriously. And essentially because the differential impact, it is going to impact the global south much more and benefit the global north in some sense. Both the effort to reach parity in development terms means energy consumption, which then they have to really forego because this will lead to irreversible climate change, but they're also going to suffer differentially the impact of the climate change. Absolutely. And if you, uh, if one understands that vulnerability to climate is an add-on to pre-existing structural vulnerabilities, which are directly correlated with poverty uh, levels. If I'm richer, I can afford to, for example, move my residence away from uncomfortably hot or sea level inundated areas, move to other uh, locations. I can change what I eat. Uh, if I'm poor, I can't do any of these things. Flexibilities are lower. Flexibilities are lower. Thank you very much for being with us. We'll watch the COP25 COP as it unfolds, yep. but not much is expected to come of no. it because essentially the leading figures who can make a difference are not there. Particularly, particularly the United States, which is in the mode of withdrawal. There's a year of yeah. notice and they're already withdrawing out of it. China and India are not represented by high-level delegations. So we'll have to see whether the COP25 really does anything or not. Looking at it, it seems to 
it will sound more warnings, but really not take any decisive steps. That's the way it is looking at the moment. Thank you very much for explaining all this to us. This is all the time we have News Click today. Do keep watching News Click.